welcome. Um, please like and subscribe if you enjoy the content. You can catch me on Twitter under SussexHenryVIII, where I'm the most active. And before we get started, I would like to say that I get so much help from my friends on Twitter to make these videos. Most end up being truly a group effort, and I want to say thank you for your continued assistance. Hello again, and welcome to my weekend. Like most who work in healthcare, I don't work the normal 9 to 5. Wednesday is my Saturday, and it's so nice to be back here with everyone. I would also like to say that I have absolutely no clue uh, about why my comments were turned off on my last video, but I will do my best to make sure that they are on for this one. Today I want to talk about a royal phenomenon called air versus spare. It's a phenomenon that in the English dates back to the 12th century. At its core, it's the concept that the second son of the monarch be kept in reserve. Kind of important, but also never allowed to threaten the heir's position. It is a place of limbo, considering it is becoming increasingly rare for an heir to die in combat or of illness. In the 12th century, the concept of primogeniture, primogeniture, I, I don't know, the word on the screen was introduced. It meant that the oldest son would be the crown prince or heir to the throne. Before that, the sons of a king would just kind of duke it out and the strongest, or the one left standing, would emerge as the heir. Primogeniture, I can't pronounce this word, introduced stability, but it also reinforced that you needed a spare, a king in reserve. The death of the heir was much more common in previous eras, with some very famous and important kings being second sons, notably my namesake Henry VIII. It is unclear who actually coined the term heir versus spare. It's been attributed to more than one person, but the modern concept was born in the 19th century, where it became tradition for the English spare to take a position in the Royal Navy and support the heir or monarch. Pardon my French, but the position of spare has always been kind of, well, shitty. On one hand, you are expected to be visible, be strong, be accomplished, but on the other hand, you are never allowed to overshadow the heir. History is littered with examples of unhappy, angry spares, some of which in times past openly rebelled against their older brothers. As times have changed, so has the battle between heirs and spares. No longer is it fought with armies, now it's fought in the media. Edward vs. Albert. We're going to start here because these two were really the first to face anything that looks like our modern press. Here are some bullet points that are going to start sounding familiar. Albert's multiple health issues were highlighted in his childhood, while Edward was promoted as being physically fit. Strings were pulled so that Albert could continue his military career despite poor grades and physical performance. Remember, a career in the Royal Navy is what was then expected of spares. It wasn't until it became clear that Edward was not going to marry a quote-unquote suitable woman and produce heirs that the royal machine spurned him in order to promote Albert, who would go on to be King George VI. Edward versus Albert is the first example I could find of the heir versus spare war being played out between their respective spouses. The Queen Mother was not well received originally, but when she was compared to Wallace Simpson, everything changed. Elizabeth versus Margaret. Now, this era hit a bit different because both the heir and the spare were women. Also, Liz became queen at age 27, and after already having the next generation of heir versus spare. The usual military avenues available to male spares were closed to Margaret, and she suffered for a long time trying to find a role in the family. The press at the time alternated between thinking the hard partying Margaret was cooler than the queen, just to turn around and promote how the queen was a pillar of stability, while her sister was an unsuited mess. The protection afforded to the queen and Prince Philip by the institution and the press were not extended to Margaret and Anthony. Despite becoming institutionally irrelevant in 1948 with the birth of Charles, Margaret was denied her first choice in marriage and other choices she would have liked to have made. There have long been rumors that Margaret wanted to leave and have more freedom, but was strong-armed into staying by the threat of the cutting of financial ties. Like Harry, Margaret went through her own third wheel phase too. After her golden years in the 50s and 60s, Margaret had many health issues, likely stemming from her heavy drinking and smoking. She died at 71, unusually early for a woman in the House of Windsor. Charles and Andrew. Charles and Andrew's heir versus spare narrative is also thrown askew because of the repeated interjections of the queen herself to protect Andrew. She has forced the institution behind her to move in ways that they would not normally for a spare, especially one that has been made doubly redundant. Royal insiders claim that Charles and Andrew were actually good friends during their youth and the early part of their respective marriages. 
Unlike other heirs and spares, there is an age gap between them, 11 years, which meant for most of Charles's early life, his spare was no threat to him. Like Edward and Albert, much of their early heir versus spare sparring was played out between their respective spouses, Diana versus Fergie. Also like his grandfather, it's alleged that strings were pulled to allow Andrew to progress in the Royal Navy. Charles and Andrew do not share a good relationship and haven't for a while. It's been alleged that Andrew resented the minimized role given to his children and blamed Charles and his plans for a slimmed down monarchy. It's also been said that Charles resents the interjections of his mother, but in the end, really who knows. And that of course brings us to William and Harry. This air versus spare battle started early in their late teens. William was seen as stable and handsome, Harry the ginger wild child. Bear with me, but I honestly think that William aging like a Windsor has been a legitimate issue for him and that he hates that Harry has progressively gotten more handsome. Anyway, back to the main story. It always seems to surprise people, but most of the shots we have of William in his late teens to mid twenties are of him and sometimes Kate stumbling out of nightclubs. Yet somehow Harry always reigns supreme as the supposedly unsteady wild one. There have been specific charges that Harry News was, and still is, trotted out to cover for William's bad behavior. That the palace basically used a young Harry as cannon fodder to make sure William remained in the public's good graces. Despite their best attempts, Harry had high popularity in the UK as William's affable, lovable spare. We have now entered what I like to call the Harry's Third Wheel era. Margaret had one too. For William and Kate, Harry was perfect in this role. Not only was he a hard worker who brought good ideas to their shared foundation, his personal life was available for them to push to the forefront whenever they needed a distraction. I honestly think they thought it would remain like this forever, or at least long enough for the Cam children to become teenagers and continue the air versus spare in a whole different generation. Harry's popularity among the public was seen as acceptable because it wasn't threatening to Will and Kate, who at the time were mostly enjoying positive press coverage themselves. I will also note that throughout his 20s, Harry was signaling publicly that he was not thrilled with the press intrusion and the job that had been forced upon him, but that was completely ignored. Then, because it didn't suit the perfect royal life narrative, and now, because it's way more fun to blame Meghan. As we know, here enters Meghan. The heir's affable third wheel all of a sudden is gone. To make matters worse for the institution, Harry's choice of wife is a rock star. Together, Harry and Meghan's popularity has now been deemed a threat to William and Kate, which for the royal family, again as an institution, is unacceptable. To make matters worse specifically for William and Kate, they are no longer getting the positive press they once did at a time where Harry, the spare, is ascendant. Harry and Meghan's very public love story comes at a time where William and Kate are being ever more accused of being work shy, again, British for lazy, and there are continued grumblings of marital discord. Again, for the royal family as an institution, this is unacceptable. Like Edward vs. Albert and Charles vs. Andrew, the heir vs. spare battle was soon fought by proxy through Kate and Meghan. I've said this before on my Twitter, but no one, not one single person, has benefited more from the press destruction of Harry and Meghan than Kate Middleton. Once the decision was made after Harry and Meghan's Australia tour to try and destroy them, overnight Kate became the patron saint of England. Kate was a white British woman who, quote, knew her place and role. She never rocked the boat, and the UK press and royal institution rewarded her heavily for it. The air couple was once again promoted as being stable and strong, despite just a few months earlier there being constant rumors of separation and them facing and then shutting down an alleged affair rumor. All this rehabilitation was on the backs of Harry and Meghan. In the Oprah interview, Meghan tells the story of the infamous crying episode. Months after the wedding, again after the decision had been made to attack, tabloids released that Meghan had made Kate cry during wedding prep. The story ran for weeks, multiple headlines decrying how the evil Meghan had made their helpless white patron saint cry. Meghan voices that she was upset that the palace refused to set the story straight, that in fact the opposite had happened. What Meghan couldn't and didn't understand at the time was that the palace was never ever going to correct any story that helped portray her as the villain and either Kate or William as the innocent party. Harry and Meghan would have been used as cannon fodder for the rest of their lives, likely their children too, in order to cover up for and prop up William and his wife. That's the way of the British royal family. In exchange for royal life, the family expected Harry and Meghan to play the game. 
the same game that has led to supremely unhappy spares since the 12th century. Harry and Meghan rightly said, no thanks, and almost two years later, the royal family and the press that covers them are still up in arms. In the days of 24-hour news cycles and social media, the air versus spare narrative has become increasingly vicious. At the end of the day, what is sad is that Will and Kate have probably deemed themselves victorious. But you have to wonder what will happen when their own children are old enough for this cycle to begin again. They will probably be left wishing that they had embraced a different kind of lifestyle for their family's spares. That's it for this one, guys. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow.